All right, everyone. Today we're going to talk about TV and well, movie, the movie industry, really. But before we get into the movie industry, since this course is all about money and finances, um, we're going to have a fun little scenario we're going to do uh, today to start the class off with. Um, so it's not necessarily for a movie, the scenario we're going to do. We're going to do it for a music video and kind of just walk through the process of working with a director or creative director to um just to start to start a music video project right so we'll walk through that process what that will look like and that process is very similar for for movies just it's going to be on a much bigger scale and of the different things that we'll get into but our, our surprise guest speaker today is my my good friend herb maximo i don't know if you go if you go by your real name but herb maximo on an instagram and everything uh, if you want to type your your instagram handle in the chat so people check out all the awesome things things you're doing but uh herb is i've, I've known him since Man, like six years, I think five, six years, Dude, and something like that's kind of crazy. Yeah, and uh, he's uh, an Emmy award-winning cinematographer uh, on a, a documentary project that he's worked on here, here in Orlando from um, after the Pulse shooting. That's so what's like a little documentary on on that, and has done lots of amazing things. I mean, he's worked with all kinds of influencers. Just picture like Gary V and all the little behind-the-scenes videos he does when he has people follow him. He's done things things like that. And his big passion, though, is music videos. And he's done all kinds of amazing music videos. And uh, you know, one of the bigger ones that I know of, I'm sure there's others, uh, is Andrew WK, uh, who has, he's done three videos for now. So he's done a lot of amazing work. And he's got much, much more important things to do. Uh, but I'm really thankful and appreciative that, that Herb's here. So welcome, welcome Herb. Thanks, dude. And did I miss, did I miss anything in the intro? Anything that you wanna want to add? Or you wanna just say a quick hello? No, to I, I need to start bringing you everywhere with me because I like, I'd never introduce myself that deeply. That's dope. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you I got you. a lot, thank you. I got you, I got you. So I guess what we'll, we'll, we'll we're start is, and I have I have an artist that you that you know of, um, that that might be doing a music video for, right? So I'll kind of make it a, a real life scenario. I won't I won't name yeah. the artist, but um, all right. So I have an artist. We have a single. It's it's gonna be our big hit single, hopefully, right? So we're gonna release a single every month for the next six months, and this single will be there's no timeline. Like it's gonna be the last single of the releases potentially unless there's a lot of momentum that's going to build before then. So basically we're, we're dropping in the hit single that we, that we hope is the hit single uh, whenever we feel like the momentum is right. So it could be one of those first six songs that are recorded. Uh, it could be sooner. It could be after. Um, but uh, so, yeah, we want to do a really, really cool music video for that. So I guess where do we start? Because I know for movies, there is something, a really important piece called a treatment, which is kind of like the, the a visual image, almost like a comic book is how I always describe it, of what the visuals are going to look like. So I guess, where do we start in figuring out what this music video is going to cost and what we should budget for it? Yeah, it's weird, man. I think like music videos are um, one of those things that's like, there's really no formula. I feel like um, maybe like the more higher end, like when you're talking like 200, $300,000 budgets, it's different. But um, like with films, we kind of like briefly talked about this yesterday when we got to link up for a minute. It's like films, usually you can start off with like a script, right? Um, but kind of answering your question, I guess, is like with a music video, if we're using the example of us, right? We're talking mm -hmm. about somebody um, possibly trying to put it together a music video. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm provided a treatment. A lot of the times I'm not. It's usually an, an artist comes to me with an idea. It's like, for example, like, oh, I, I really want to shoot in we had an Andrew WK music video come out yes today actually so oh, cool. for example it's like I really want to shoot in a place that's like just walls and walls of lamps for example you know mm -hmm. so I feel like most of the time it's something like that they just have like a crazy idea and they want help like putting it together like painting that picture mm -hmm. um and so that's kind of when like my role as producer slash creative director comes in I'm kind of like the translator between the client which would be either the artist or the manager or whoever i'm talking to that has the idea mm -hmm. the translator between them and um the production team like the people running the cameras running the lights and all that and from that um that's kind of how i end up creating a treatment and then i'll put together a storyboard if we need it if it's something that's pretty story um sh like strong driven i guess is the word mm -hmm. um and so yeah that's pretty much just to kind of like 
get everybody on the same page, you know? So I guess that would be step one. Okay. So we have the, the treatment and the, the storyboard. Um, and let's say this is a song that has a little bit more of a story, right? So would you, are, are you creating the storyboard then essentially, and you're presenting that to the, the artist team? Like, so you present that to me, the manager? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're telling me an idea, if you're the manager and you're telling me, well, we want like a bunch of birds that like wear sombreros, you know, and they're all like dancing or something. So I'll take your crazy idea and like, just kind of make it like something that we can actually shoot because that idea sounds crazy, but it can work if it makes sense. So my job is to kind of like make that story work, put it together in like, you, I make a PDF, you know, just almost like a, a glorified like PowerPoint pretty much. Okay. And that will be that. And that way I can get the approval of you mm -hmm. and your artist. And then um, I have something to give the production team, which I'm also the production team. I'm just saying kind of like, you know, um, I'll create it in pre-production. And then once we shoot it, we have that to refer to. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have, we have the storyboard, we have a, the story through the song, right? And so in, in the film industry, I, I would now, well, we would have to budget it out first and then I would go seek funding for that budget. Right. So I guess once you create your storyboard, we approve it. Let's say there's, I guess within the storyboard, at what point do you determine how many different locations that we need to shoot this music video? Is that something determined by you and the storyboard? Is that something that, that I determine? How does that portion work? Uh I mean, for me, I really have never, um, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I've never worked with somebody that said, all right, how much money do we need? We'll figure it out. It's usually like, this is what we have, you know? Yeah. So that's a good and a bad thing, I guess, because the money's accounted for. I know what my limit is um, yeah. and there's no really guessing work, you know? Mm -hmm. So I can answer it from like, my experience is that like, we'll come up with a story and I'll be like, hey, this is something that like, we're going to have to fly to Scotland for, like, we right. can't do that in one day, you know? So like, right. this is the idea, like, we're going to have to like, take a day of travel, a day of shoot, you know? So it kind of becomes like, is this in the budget? If it's not, let's mm -hmm. scale it down. We don't have to go to Scotland. We can find like a field that looks like Scotland or something, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think again, you know, it's just like one of those things that every situation is different. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, like I said, it's kind of like, I usually deal with the budgets that are already built. Like this is yeah. what we have, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and then and from there, you know, I kind of put together, I know what my team usually costs for like a base of like three crew, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we want some more lights or more cameras or whatever, then we start adding to it. So I know what that's going to cost. And then whatever's, whatever we have left over goes into, you know, extra days. Or mm -hmm. if we need to rent a helicopter, that type of thing, you know. Yeah, okay. and uh, and so, Lacey, Lacey had a question. So uh, thanks for that. By the way, Lacey, uh, if anybody has any questions, I should have added that in the beginning. Uh, just feel free to throw those in the chat as as well. Um, but she asked, is the budget discussion before or after you create the storyboard? For me, it's kind of like during because, okay. you know, we'll have the initial discussion, so I get an idea of what they want, and we kind of have a little bit of like we like flirt with the idea of the budget, just so I can kind of like. Because I, I personally don't love saying, what do you want to spend right away? You know, because right. not only to the client, is it kind of intimidating? Like, why do you know how, why do you want to know how much money I have? You know? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's kind of like, I need to get an idea of where they're at. Mm -hmm. Like, it's pretty simple to know if you're, if you're working with $5,000 or $60,000 or $200,000. So right. I kind of get a rough idea of like where on the spectrum it is. And then from there, as I'm writing the story, we're kind of going back and forth because, um, you know, I don't want to write a story that's going to cost a whole bunch of money and they're only trying to put like $3,000 into an aspect that would cost a lot more, you know, so. Yeah. And then she had another question. So as you're putting this budget together or as the budget is being put together or the storyboard along with the budget, um, you kind of then trim the fat of like, I guess, most ideal scenario with the budget to kind of meet the budget. So let's say you get a $5,000 budget, but you're putting a storyboard together and you're like, man, it's really going to cost more like six grand. Um, do you guys can start figuring out what you can cut and trim to meet that $5,000 budget? Like, how do I figure out? Is that what you're asking? No, is, is that something you, you do? Like, do you oh. figure out what, what to cut to still yeah. make it look great? And just I actually had a call yesterday with um, somebody that they're trying to, exactly what you're saying. The, the scenario is exactly the same. So it's like, all right, well, let me see what I can cut 
but the thing is like sometimes i mean you get what you pay for you know you really do yeah. um my prices are pretty much like set in stone for the most part i can cut things but i'm saying like if i end up cutting something it's not like oh i'm not gonna like wear a hat today it's like i'm not gonna bring <laughs> this extra crew member which is gonna cost you 500 dollars. so we can cut 500 dollars out but now we lost access to his equipment and things like that you know what i'm saying so it really depends on like um the story yeah mm -hmm. like I, I can cut a few things but um it comes at a price you know mm -hmm. like you'll you will save money but you're not going to save on the concept um right if you will, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so, okay, so kind of, it'll suffer a little bit. So, so Lacey's got some good questions. So do you ever convince them to other convince them otherwise, since they're representing your work, right? So let's say I come to you, have a $5,000 budget. You're in an ideal scenario. You need six um, to make it uh, look the way they want and the way you want. Cause you're the creative director behind it. Um, you sometimes try to push for them to spend a little more. Yeah, for sure. It happens a lot. And um it's kind of easy for me because like I said earlier, my, my price is set. Like mm. if you give us $5,000, I'm covered. I'm good. Right. If I ask you for, for, for more money, I'm trying to do you the favor. I'm not making more money out of it. I'm trying to get those extra props for you, for right. you, you know? Mm. So it's like, I'm not trying to pull a quick one on you or anything like that. Like <laughs> this is for you. Like, I think right. like if you're this passionate about your project, let me help you by like presenting some things for you, you know, like mm -hmm. nothing's free. Everything, everything that's worth money is going to cost money. So that's kind of the approach I take. It's like, you know, I'm not making money from this. I just want it to look better for you. Right. And they usually say yes, because, you know, if you're spending a, a decent chunk of money already, you're passionate about it. You yeah, know? So. sure. And, and it probably helps when you work with people that, you know, let's say like, I came to you and like, hey, we have a five thousand dollar budget, and then you came back, and you know, like you're working with people that have the money to spend. Like you probably can push a little bit harder because you know they're they're going to spend that money. But if I'm sure you also right. have scenarios where, like five thousand dollars is the max. Like I've been saving for mm -hmm. a year. Right. Yeah, that's, that happens. Well. That's all I can have. Yeah. Um. So okay, for so sure. you have the, the budget figured out. You have the storyboard figured out. Then the next part is you probably need to get permits for the locations that you're going to yeah it's the whole pre-production um stage of it so like the plan the planning in the sense of like the concept is done right and so yeah it's just kind of like all right so we want to sh find some birds with some burrs right like so <laughs> i need to just get on instagram and search hashtags or whatever and just like find the people so it just the whole process of like finding permits is more than just that. Um, it's, it's finding the permits, but before that, finding the location, mm -hmm. finding any extra random props, like, you know, like the birds and some burrows. I don't know why I keep saying that. But I, I kinda like it. <laughs> That's a scenario you know? today. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's because I have a hat today. Yeah. Mini, mini some burrows. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it just, it comes to that, you know, um, just then, like the logistics of it because like the creative part is kind of done and now it's like all right well we have these ideas and they're solidified and everybody approves of it and it's like cohesive where it's a story that just make it makes sense and has a flow so yeah let's then, figure out um where we're going to shoot it what we need and scheduling you know and i would, I would assume the three main types of locations would be either like something you own right so that's you own the studio or or i own the studio that doesn't need really a permit or any kind of approval i could just say yes this is my studio you can shoot here or you would say yes this is my studio you can shoot at my studio um so that probably be one scenario another scenario would be someone else's private property right so let's say you're doing a a shoot at a millionaire mansion you probably need to get that person's permission um which probably looks a little bit different maybe there's an agreement uh, there maybe not and then there might be city property. Like let's say you're doing it at Lake Eola. Uh, you probably need some some permits from the city. Um, I guess what what are some of the different things that you would need in the other locations where we don't own the property if you're going to someone else's property or to something that's city owned? Before I answer that, I want to mention uh, kind of going back to an earlier question when you when you, like you've kind of meet the well, I don't know if it was a question, but it's kind of an important point. If you met the cap of the budget and you start cutting things, right? It's like all right, well, let's get creative. Like we can't rent that studio anymore, but my living room's big enough. Maybe we could use that, you know? So it's kind of like pulling in those favors. So I just wanted to sink that in, like use the resources you already have before you start renting 
a hotel room when your bedroom already looks kind of cool you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. yeah um and then you were asking how to get kind of those more location kind of like private locations yeah it's like right? kind of? so if you're let's say you get a hotel room right and you did it there um can you i mean <laughs> there's the legal way to do it and then just doing it super diy and hope nobody notices but if you're shooting it in a hotel room you'd probably have to get some kind of permission from the the hotel and probably okay, have, yeah, create, I mean, have like, some kind of deal with them if you if it's like a small production man honestly yeah just go in gorilla style and just kind of just do it try not to get caught, like <laughs> yeah. you know like probably not the best advice to, to give but um i definitely don't do it have done a, that a lot don't do it at a chain so marriott doesn't come calling <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know honestly like something that we've discovered lately is that not even lately but it's it's so easy like all you have to do is ask right and kind of like the update to that is that like people were almost begging you to rent out their spot for um like anything because of covid you know like we just shot in a theater like a month ago and they were just so like we thought it would be so random it was like a like an opera theater Mm -hmm. and we thought it'd be so random and they were just so happy so it really just takes like an email or a call right and it's and, and some it takes. and some private locations take a lot of pride in that right it's, because it's great exposure yeah. for them and that's a great yeah. way for them to promote their location i know there's this, this forget the name of it there's this blueberry farm i go to and you, you cannot go and shoot pictures there without getting permission for them but then they also advertise the people that have done photography there yeah. or done videos there or movies there so it's like it's a, it's a pride piece too for for them for sure and then if you use a city-owned location let's say you did lake eola um then you would just have to get permission and permits from the city? Yeah, so luckily for me, like I just kind of like set it all up. I've never had to pull a permit. I just like have somebody on the team do it. But I mean, again, I, I believe it's it's just as simple mm-hmm. where you just like contact them. Um, the most recent one we did, we were in Daytona Beach and we pulled two permits and I can't remember which one was which, but one was to shoot on the beach. One was to shoot just walking around town one of them was free and the other one was $30. Okay. So like, it's not as intimidating as it kind of seems, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure as you have like bigger productions, like if you're like blocking off a road and you're shooting Justin Bieber, like that's different, you know? But sure. for yeah. our crew was like, I think seven people for that one. Mm-hmm. Um, it was pretty simple. Uh, I think they just asked for um, like, make sure that the production company has insurance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, usually- you, you, would, you would think that usually dealing with, I guess, the, the government, right, that the cities would be a hard thing, but it's actually fairly easy. Uh, yeah. All, all those steps are already laid out. I mean, you get you get the permits. They're usually pretty cheap. It's probably cheaper using city property than, than private property sometimes, right, unless you're getting it for free because someone is really excited that you're using their property. But if you are if you are paying top dollar, then private property probably a lot of times be more than, than city property because cities just the only time it's city city stuff it's expensive when you have to start blocking roads and bringing bringing cops yeah. in to, to keep things private so okay so it's kind of like the pre-production stuff i'm sure there's a lot more to that process um and then what what are all the different types of people on the crew um from cameras lighting set design and all that what, what kind of i guess job positions are there um so for us our like base like three people we always have a minimum of three people and that's just like super bare bones you know and that would be the director who also doubles up as a dp director of photography so he's kind of like running the show holding the camera you know pointing it at people and stuff and then we'll have somebody who doubles up as ac which is an assistant camera and gaffer who's doing the lighting so um the director will say okay this is a shot um we want it to make it feel like there's a window coming from camera right. So let's put a light there. And then, you know, let's have like a, a lamp back here or something. So the ga- gaffer will do that, set up the light. And then um, and then we'll, we'll have a PA, which is just a, all around production assistant, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's bare bones. Um, and all those positions, like at that point, like each person would have like three jobs, right? Cause I said director mm-hmm. and director of photography. So. Mm-hmm. On bigger sets, we'll have just a director who is at this point um, kind of more in touch with the talent, mm-hmm. you know, helping them um, 
get the emotions right and all that movement and all that stuff. Director of photography is the one in charge of like the camera and the way that it moves and what it's capturing and the lighting and all that. Um, and the gaffer is still, you know, um, setting up the lights and stuff. And assistant camera is a person that um, will help the director of photography. Um, when he needs a break and stuff like that, he'll be the one that grabs the camera. When it's time to change lenses or batteries, that's the person that runs to get it. So there's a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. yeah, what about and that's just kind of like the base. So mm -hmm. what about as far as the talent goes? So if you're on a bigger production, what all do you need for the talent? Like, like is there a wardrobe person and makeup, hair? What all is there? To uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely we've had sets where there's both. We've had mm -hmm. sets where there's none. Mm -hmm. um, there's always kind of like somebody who has like a line producer role who's kind of in charge of making sure we're running on schedule mm -hmm. and making sure, all right, um, talent A is going to be on camera in 15 minutes. Better the person making sure they're in wardrobe and get everything done. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's just one of those things, again, that comes to budget. It's like, um, who are we allowed to bring? Because everybody even though it kind of sounds like overkill if you have like 30 people on set sometimes it is you know 30 people is a lot but they all have a role and they all make somebody else's life easier mm -hmm. and then after you're done shooting um and if there's any i'm skipping uh let me know i know we're doing like it's more like it's just um you know thirty thousand foot view basic kind of stuff but it, after the everything's over then it's really just the editing right is there anybody else involved besides the person editing like would it be like an editor and a director maybe like, how does that Work. um yeah so um usually it's like we'll have an uh, assistant editor mm -hmm. who will organize all the footage because the andrew wk music video that came out today we had just over eight hours of footage which wow sounds like a lot but it also doesn't sound like a lot but to it's, kind of it's give a five, perspective, five, mi five minute and five second video yeah and just <laughs> to kind of give some perspective an average video that i would shoot that that's that that's the length like five minutes or five yeah five minutes I think we'd have like an hour and a half of footage. Wow. Just to kind of give, you know, but I think we had like 30 performances and like, oh, we had like 10 different locations. But anyway, uh, the assistant editor will take that eight hours of footage and organize it all. Like he'll make, all right, this is where, this is just B-roll footage, which is just kind of like detail shots um, at the lamp store. This is B-roll shots at the cave. We shot in a cave. I didn't know there were caves in Orlando. Uh, you know, and just everything organized and like syncing the audio with the video because that's what takes the longest, you know, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you're shooting music videos, we have playback playing and they're mm -hmm. kind of like playing to the song. Got it. And so when you have 30 takes, you have the song laid out on your e like editing software and you have to line up the video with it. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It doesn't mm -hmm. automatically line up. So we have right. that assistant editor do that, kind of start to clean it up. Um, and for Andrew's video that came out today, there's two of us editing it. Like we were both at the computer at the same time. Wow. Uh, doing that just because again, it was such a big project. And mm -hmm. um, as we've like reached like certain like milestones, almost kind of like, we'll kind of get the revisions reviewed. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Like we'll get to a good start stopping mm -hmm. point uh, that's presentable. And then we would show it to Andrew. All right, here's where we're at. He'll kind of give us, um, direction of what he's feeling um you know the first one kind of be ready because it might not be a good reaction you know <laughs> but have faith in yourself so mm -hmm. but yeah that's usually how it goes you know um I mean, when assistant you're editor main editor you get some notes and revisions to make and then yeah and then um if you have two people editing at once like you had on this video uh would it are you guys in the same room and working on uh, the software together like on the same on the same file or is that you're working from different locations on the same file or you have your each your separate files and you combine them together was, or you do sections all those things are um are options and then all those things are people things that people do but what we did for this one is that we had um we're working on separate files working on separate things, but same project, you know what I'm saying? Like he'll be working on this scene he's, and then I'll be working on that scene. Got it. And then once we would kind of catch up with each other, we would merge the files and then kind of be on the same computer. Got it. And then at that point it's kind of like two brains at the same time because we were just organizing when we were working separately. And then when we sat together, it was more of like, all right, let's clean it up, make it creative, make it look cool. Mm -hmm. you know? 
And then I guess the other last question I'll have, and we'll see if anybody has any questions. But um, if it wasn't the music video, let's say it's like a mini documentary or commercial or, or whatever, right? Um, at what point do you pick the music? Like, do you do that in the editing portion, or are you doing that? Is that in pre-production? Is that what point is the music so selected? Uh, uh, Ideally, everything's pre-production. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Ideally, like, if I I like to go into a project knowing what the video is already going to look like. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, having everything planned that way, because, like, early on, when I first started, and I feel like a lot of people are like this when they first start, maybe probably everybody, you kind of, like, just show up and just point a camera around and, like, hope that it looks good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I've failed so many times trying that. You know, it's just not a good... Uh, <laughs> It's not a good strategy. So 100% uh, in pre-production, we want to get everything laid out and everything planned out. So that way, when we show up, we already know what our results are going to be, mm -hmm. including the music, you know, like mm -hmm. imagine shooting um, just a commercial and you think it's supposed to be an upbeat commercial. So you're, the whole time you're shooting it, you kind of are thinking happy music and you shot it with some nice movement that's supposed to kind of be uplifting. And then when you start to edit, you send the client some options of music and they say, oh no, we want this to be sad. It's like, well, I just did everything happy. Yeah. You know? uh, that's kind of an extreme example, but it's always good to be on the same page before any moving parts start to move. You know? mm -hmm. Awesome, cool. Uh, I, I think this is cool. Is there anything else that you want to add um, just to give, like, I guess the students like a 50,000 foot view of, of this whole process that we didn't? It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's so crazy because like the video that I just keep saying this because like it came out today. It's like fresh on my mind. Mm -hmm. It's a five minute long video. We took two and a half weeks to shoot it. Wow. You know, like this wasn't like, let's shoot it in one day. This was two and a half weeks. And then another two weeks of editing mm -hmm. for a five minute long video that probably like a handful of people watched all the way through. Right. You know, Man. like five minutes is a lot. So like, long, I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine a lot of people sitting through the whole thing. So um, it's a lot of work. I don't know. Yeah. You know? What, what, what uh, editing software do you use for that? Uh, I use DaVinci Resolve. It's kind of like becoming the standard, especially for coloring. Mm -hmm. um, you type that in here. There, there's a free version, right? There's a free version, a paid version. Yeah, there's a free version. There's a paid version. Um, I don't even really know the difference. I think you can do... Uh, most of the same stuff besides like maybe export. I don't know. I'm like, mm. actually, I'm going to stop it there because I have no idea what I'm saying. Mm. I don't know what the difference is, but I mean, it is the same, same program, but yeah, it's kind of, it's like the industry standard at this point. I mm. think most people are switching to that from um, Adobe Premiere, which I feel like everybody kind of has at least heard of. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't wait to either get the new software update on my Mac or get a new Mac so I can play around with DaVinci because Premiere Pro is killing me. <laughs> okay, so even if you try uh, DaVinci on the computer you have right now, it works so much faster. Yeah? Yeah, I wish I like, I'm not that much of like a computer geek like when it comes to like specs and stuff. So I, I wish I kind of was when it came to this because I don't know, something about the way that it runs, it uses a different something of your computer, but it just mm. runs so much faster. It's insane. And the, the the guy I was editing the NGWK video for with that just came out, he uses Premiere. So that project was actually done in Premiere. Got it. And it's just like, ugh, I don't like using <laughs> Premiere. But I think there's a lot of that. Like there's one production company that I used to edit for in LA and they would send me hard drives to edit from. And they were using Final Cut, which is crazy to me. I feel like nobody really uses Final Cut anymore. Mm -hmm. So for all the students, if y'all want to play around with some editing software and you're trying to use something free, um, I know on Macs, we have iMovie, we have um, <laughs> Lacey's Final Cut. Um, I don't like Final Cut. Adobe Premiere is pretty popular, but DaVinci Resolve is free. And I, I think you've told me, and I've definitely read this on the Wikipedia page for Image Resolve, on the free version, they've literally done Marvel movies on, on the free version. So the, the bells and whistles on that yep. is endless. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, definitely check that out. Um, does anybody have any questions for her? But I've already gone way over time than I planned to keep you. Sorry about that. Oh, man, it's all good. <laughs> Awesome. You said this was been great. Awesome. Well, I'll get on to my my boring uh, lecture about the economics and 
finance side of the music in uh, the movie industry. Um, you're, you're welcome to stay, but I know you have a lot of, lot to do. Um, so thank, thank, thank you so much for, for taking time and, um, uh, yeah, looking forward to sharing this with everybody else that wasn't, that wasn't here today. Awesome, man. Yeah. Thank you. It was fun. I'm glad we got to do it again. It's been a little while since I got to talk with, talk with you about this stuff. So I'm happy to have you every semester. So <laughs> dude, I'm down. <laughs> okay. I'm down. Awesome. Let's do it. <laughs> cool. All right, man. Cool. Take care. Thanks so See much. Guys. Take care. All right. So let me share my slides. And we'll get into some of the fun movie stuff. All right. Does anybody have any any questions? I guess about class or anything before I, I dive into the lecture. It'll be a shorter lecture, obviously. I mean, I guess all in all, will be still close to an hour. But does anybody have any questions before I get started? No. Okay. And as always, just just feel free to chime in at any point. So, the first question I have for y'all: what what is a in what is an asset? Before I ask you, what's an income producing asset? I'm sure most of y'all have taken an accounting class, right? So what is an asset? Something of value, yep. So something of value that you own, right? So your company, right? So your car has value. Um, your house has value, right? So that's an asset. I mean, literally everything. My laptop is an asset. My microphone is an asset, right? Those are all assets. Um, property in general, yep. So usually if I buy a car and I drive it off the lot, you guys have have you all heard the term that the second you drive it off the lot, you you lose ten percent in value, right? So that's a depreciating asset. So that's an asset that loses value over time, which is which is so sad to spend so much money on a car. I just got a new car. Uh, to spend so much money on a car and it loses value literally the second you drive it off the lot. That's just very depressing for me. So what is an income producing asset? And what are some examples of income producing assets? And y'all will see, see why <laughs> I'm starting this way in a second. What are income producing assets? Real estate, rentals, yep. Stocks, yep. Those are, those are two great ones. Any others? Right, so I'll share. Uh, so real estate, right? There's a few different types of real estate. There's residential, where it's just housing, um, apartments, condos, and so on, right? And there's commercial, where you have the big, uh, you know, strip malls or a mall or uh, anything other at a bigger scale, where you have like businesses moving in. You have land, right? That's an income-producing asset. Um, you have investment accounts. Yep. So like investment accounts would include stocks, bonds, right? Yeah, would it include mutual funds, uh, 401ks, Roth IRAs. Uh, gold, silver, and like metals are income producing assets too. As we talked about in the economics lecture, we looked at the price of gold, how much that has gone up uh, since the Fed was created. Uh, cryptocurrency is an income producing asset, right? So it's any, any asset that gains value. And, and the reason this is relevant to, to the class, another really important income producing asset is intellectual property. So that's property that basically a creation from the mind, right? It's an intellectual property. And that can be music, movies, books, scripts, uh, poems, uh, dance choreography. So it can be any kind of artwork, right? Whether it's a painting, a graphic design, uh, it can be architectural plans. It can be any type of really content you produce. So if you have a podcast, every single episode of your podcast, if you're doing one a week or you're doing a daily one, Every episode is a piece of intellectual property and that property can gain value, right? So let me, uh, let me drop a quick link here. This is still a link to copyright.gov forward slash registration. So if you go here, it shows you all the different types of intellectual property you can uh, copyright. And usually intellectual property is protected by copyrights, right? So you want to register a copyright for your intellectual property. Um, and where was I going with this? <laughs> the thought I had before I dropped the link in there. Oh yeah, so with the, with the content, right? So like, you might be putting out a podcast every week, and you might think, oh, this might not be. That's not worth a lot of money because I'm just doing a podcast and I have a few. Maybe it's a podcast that's big enough that has a few sponsors and an audience, right? But how how else does this podcast make money? We'll take Joe Rogan for example, right? When he sold his entire library or licensed it, his entire library to Spotify to where he's now exclusive to Spotify and there's no more episodes on, on YouTube, which is where it was before. He got millions of dollars for that, right? It's like, I think it was a five-year 
um, ten million dollar deal or something like that. So two million dollars a year for for ten years uh, or for five years. So a podcast can be worth a lot of money too. So that's an income producing asset, right? And that's something he's just doing for free at, at his at his home studio. Uh, so the same thing with movies, music videos, or music in general, uh, anything written, right? So all those are income producing assets. So one of the things you could do if you want to um, create more more I guess a net worth for yourself or create an asset. If you don't have to finance this yet to buy a bunch of stuff like stocks, bonds, investments, real estate, right? You could create things. And those creations, if you get really, really good at it, those tend to have value. So enter the, the film. Well, I guess before we get into the film industry, um, so I just want to take a quick look at a few little stocks. Um, well, not little stocks, big stocks, but uh, Disney is one of the major leaders in the in the film industry right and here's just a, a view of disney's stock over over the years right so as you see if you bought the stock in the beginning you bought it under probably as little as ten dollars and that stock has gained value for, since 2012 to today so nine years later that 10 to 20 dollars is now worth 180 dollars right so that's a giant increase in value of your 20 bucks if you bought a share of disney and We'll get into this when we get into the stocks lecture, but buying a share of stock is is pretty easy. Um, now, I <laughs> want to encourage y'all to always seek financial advice before buying stuff. That's what you should be doing, right? But you can buy stocks pretty easy. There's, there's apps like Robinhood and Webull. You can download and just literally just go buy a $20 stock and hope it increases in value. Um, the best types of investing is long-term investing. So I don't, I want to discourage anyone from doing anything crazy like day trading or swing trading. Uh, definitely want to try to invest in good stocks, really do your homework. And we'll look at that uh, in week six and how to do your homework for stocks and think about long-term investing. So you can take that 20 bucks, right? Maybe buy five shares at 20 bucks and that, and that you know, $400 worth. And then those five shares are five times, you know, $183 after nine years. Um, Another example like Netflix. Um, let me see, Megan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, gotten a few docs. Uh, yeah, so if you look at the charts, uh, going back, right, speaking of COVID, uh, so Disney right here, right, it was at, right, right above $150, and then it crashed below $100 during COVID. So if you bought, uh, so as, as is a saying in an in investing world, buy the dip, right? So if you bought that dip right here, even at a hundred bucks, let's say you weren't in at the beginning, but you bought that dip at a hundred bucks and you bought 10 shares at a hundred dollars a piece. Those 10 shares are now worth almost $2,000, right? So you almost doubled your money in a year. Uh, so that's a really, really great amount of appreciation. Um, if you look at Netflix, look how that has jumped up. So imagine that being in on Netflix when that was at like 10, $20, that stock is now at $551 a share. Um, and then AMC, I mean, you know, AMC, crashed pretty hard over the last few years and we, we, we can talk about the whole wall street bets thing too but um so it really crashed during during COVID right here then it had a little bit of spike so that's the whole wall street bet stuff that that was going on where they spiked the stock then it crashed again when that that hype was all over but now look at it now it's spiked again um probably a combination of the movie industry, you know, the theaters being back in business and, and those Wall Street bet, bets guys still messing with, with, with AMC. Um, and then the last one, uh, this is Bitcoin. So at the end, end of the semester, we'll get into cryptocurrency, but this is kind of the rise, how, how Bitcoin has climbed, right? So it started really low. It started, you know, below $100 a share of Bitcoin, got as high as $60,000 for one share. And even still today, right? It's sitting at, so this was literally a screenshot right before class it's sitting at $32,000 a share. So if you bought that Bitcoin at $100 or even at $1,000, you'd be really happy today having that Bitcoin. Um, Y'all don't want to know the mistake that I made when I sold my Bitcoin five years ago uh, because it was, I climbed up to a little bit right around here and I thought that was great. I made some money. <laughs> Why do I wish I would have kept it till it's here? Uh, anyways, so well, how do movies start to get made? So uh, you have to, it starts with the story, right? So as Herb and I just talked about, you have a story. So the song was the story in, in the movie industry, your, your script, your screenplay is a story, right? So that's your concept that you start working with. And there's a few different types of stories that they work with, right? It's literally, a, it's, um, it, it's a, it could be a literary property that's already in existence. So it could be based on a book, a novel, um, uh, sometimes it can be based on a poem or whatever, right? Or it could be 
uh, based on on fan um, writings, like fans creating their own versions of a, a of a story. Um, I don't know if I'm totally butchering this. But I'm thinking about the Fifty Shades of Grey uh, writer. I think that came from from like fan fiction, right? From from some TV show. Um, I don't know. I don't know that story too well, but I know that 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 series came from fan fiction. Um, very, very poorly written, but really profitable for for this writer. Um, it can also come just from a brand new story, right? And brand new story being created, which is I know Hollywood gets a lot of slack for it. And not a lot of movies these days are not original movies. They're all adaptations from a book or something or from, uh, you know, a true event. A true event could be another uh, reason. So Twilight. Okay, this is Twilight fanatic, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Got it. Um, what was I thinking? I think I was thinking Twilight. Um, I don't know. Anyways, but but thanks for that. Um, so those are the three main sources of stories, right? Could be liter- um, something that's already in existence, could be a new story, or it could be a true event that happened and they're creating a, a story out of that. So once you have the story, then what gets involved is the agents. So agencies. Um, so what agencies will do is they will um, basically outline the script. And what that means is they're getting the team together, right? And that's another term in the movie, movie industry called packaging. So the the agents, they're going to create a package now with this the script, and then they're going to try to sell this entire package. And this is something pretty new. So before I'm going to go back to the packaging in a second, what, what all that includes, but the movie industry uh, is pretty much an oligopoly, right? So oligopoly instead of monopoly means there's a handful of companies that control the entire industry. Um, and that's true to the music industry that's true to the movie industry and many others and in the agency world so there's a there's two different um oligopolies that are happening in the movie industry you have the agencies and you have the movie production houses right and in the agency world there's a there's a few and i mean i don't really do quizzes and stuff but if i were to ask you on a quiz i would make you remember those and those are caa wme uta and ICM. If you type in any of those initials in a Google search and agency afterwards, you'll, you'll find their websites and you'll see what, what they work with. But these four are, are part of what the music industry calls the big six. So there's, there's other two other agencies in the music industry, but these four are what's called full service agencies. So a full service agency can represent all different types of um, areas of entertainment, right? And one of the main ones is literary. So it's the writers, right? The story, the storytellers, people that write, uh, you know, they can write books, they can write scripts, all kinds of different literary work that they represent. Then they'll represent pretty much any other department, right? So directors, they represent directors. So what they'll take a script and pair it with a director when they start packaging, they represent actors and actresses, and they'll take take them and pair them now with a director and a script, right? So we have the script, we have this director working on it, they'll package that. Um, Sometimes they'll add the locations where it's going to be at if uh, they have ownership of a certain location or if they just have a, a treatment, right, or the storyboard of, of the script uh, that gets created. Um, they have a story, they, they will find a producer and then figure out an estimated budget and they'll take that entire package and they will sell that to the production companies. Um, and then with the full service agency aspect, so what makes them a full service agency? One, they offer all of that. They're building the team, right? They're building the package for, for the movie, but then they also have other departments. So let's say one of the actors in the movie is also a singer. They could, so let's say it's Hugh Jackman. Uh, that, that, that agency could now book Hugh Jackman's entire tour, right? Or let's say Hugh Jackman wants to act in Broadway, which he has done before. They could book his Broadway shows for him and work with the, the Broadway uh, production companies. Um, they also will, if, if since they have a literary department, if Hugh Jackman wanted to write a book, they could release a book, right? Uh, if he was an athlete, uh, they could also negotiate his his deal with a, a team, right? So where, where that has happened for, for CAA, especially, they, they were famous for a massive deal where it's a long time ago now. I don't, I don't know if you all remember this, but it was a really big deal when LeBron James, uh, Chris Bosh, and Dwayne Wade came to the Miami Heat, right? So those three players were basically packaged together and brought to this team. One was already there, but they kept him there, and then they brought these other two players to the team, creating a super team. And it was CAA that created the super team for, for the Miami Heat. And 
So, you know, so CAA, who represented LeBron James, I don't know if they still do, but they probably also booked him for the movie Trainwreck that he was in. Uh, they, if you want to do speaking engagements and tour and, and speak, they could book that and, and so on, right? So that's a full service agency. Um, and and, they're, and um, CAA and William Morris are, are the major, major powerhouses of, of the movie, movie industry. Um, so once you have the package, you need to find funding. So where do you find funding? How do you fund a film? A question to y'all. How would you, how, where, what are some sources for funding? Private investors. Yep, that's exactly one. Uh, tax breaks. So tax breaks will help your funding and budgeting, right? Um, so tax breaks, it's a good one that, that, that Megan added. Tax breaks could determine where you might shoot your film, right? So a lot of movies are actually not being filmed in Hollywood right now. Um, they're being filmed in Georgia because uh, Georgia has amazing tax incentives for film companies to produce their films there. So it's crazy. They have all these studios sitting there in Hollywood and they're not really sitting empty, but there's like the saying, like they're, they're basically sitting empty because they're shooting all these films in, in Georgia. So there's all these film studios now in, in Atlanta and other, other places in Georgia. Um, you know, for, for a short time, Florida was, was a place where a lot of film films came, uh, was a very, very short time. I think it was a sh one show we watched on, on Netflix. Um, I forget the name of it, but the, 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 the show was shot in the keys, the Florida keys, but then the final season was shot in Georgia because Florida got rid of their tax incentives, which I know it's a bummer because it's been fun to have the, the film industry here, right? Uh, same happened in Louisiana. Louisiana was like really, really big in the film industry and then they uh, got rid of their tax breaks. But anyways, it's a long tangent. Uh, Amanda also said grants. Grants is definitely another uh, source for funding. Uh, you have the industry sources, right? So you have the different studios, uh, which we'll get into in a second. You have independent distributors, sometimes talent agencies. So the William Morris's of the world might fund a project themselves. Uh, you have the TV networks. So doing like, you know, um, when, when NBC rarely does a, their own movie or I know USA and TNT, some of those channels will have like their own movies sometimes. Uh, so the TV networks can fund them. Uh, so also cable networks. Uh, sometimes you have a home video distributor that will uh, fund a film to go straight to, to DVD. And then of course you have your new giants in the industry, uh, the streaming services, right? Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Disney Plus. I mean, Disney Plus, Disney used to be uh, one of the production companies we'll get into in a second, but now they're also... A streaming platform so they're literally creating content just for their streaming platform um i don't know anybody's watching loki yet but i've heard of, heard of good things loki uh anyway so then you have lenders um which could be banks insurance companies distributors right you can get grants uh and investors uh that could be public or private investors uh and you can crowdfunding there's there's projects that were being crowdfunded i'm currently part of a uh, a documentary that we're that we're crowdfunding, um, trying to raise three hundred thousand dollars. Already hit a hundred, so hopefully we'll hit the the last two hundred um, in the next eighty days. We have eighty more days to try to raise two hundred thousand dollars. Scary, but anyways, so crowdfunding is another way you could raise a lot of money for for films, right? Um, and then, what are some of the major forces influencing the film industry? What are some of the major things that impact the industry? So I guess just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll say te technological advances, right? So as technology advances, that has a major impact on the industry, both positive and negative. I mean, you the, it makes the movie creation process a lot better and easier. Like Herb and I just talked about the this, this software called DaVinci Resolve, which is a free software. Um, and I also have a paid version, but y'all can literally download DaVinci Resolve and use the exact same software that has was used to make, you know, one of the, the, the Marvel movies. Um, so a lot, a lot of great resources that you now have through technology, but technology also makes it a lot easier to, to steal movies, right? So piracy is also a really, really big uh, factor that or big force that influences the music industry or the movie industry, I keep saying music. Um, marketing and audience sampling, right? So figuring out different strategies and ways to to market and promote a film uh, and figuring out there's you know a lot of different ways now you can create surveys and uh, figure out what kind of film would do really, really well, you know, in six months from now or so, or so like, right, really, really figure out a pain point right now that might exist in the world or in a, a society or a community somewhere and create a film around that that might just come out in the next six months or a year. Um, so surveying your, your audience and really knowing your audience uh, is another method um, that's gotten easier and easier. And then distribution and data storage, right, that's also impacting the film industry because now you have those streaming streaming platforms where now films are made direct for streaming. They're no longer, not all of them are going directly to the movie theater first, right? And then to streaming. Um, 
because some of them are going straight to streaming and they're getting nominated for awards now, which is crazy. Uh, you know, before you would have to be in a movie theater to be nominated for an award. Now you have Netflix films winning uh, Emmys and Oscars, which is, which is wild. What kind of uh, time we're in uh, data storage capabilities, right? So you have endless amounts of movies being stored on this one platform like Netflix or Disney plus, or even YouTube. I mean, look at YouTube, how much content is being stored on, on YouTube and it's millions of videos a day being uploaded to YouTube. So state of storage is another big force that's impacting the movie industry. Then you have your, your five major distributors. So again, the whole oligopoly, right? There's, there used to be more. So uh, here is your, your, I guess the ones that have created the most productions in uh, what's it since 1948. Um, so, so since 1948, these are the companies that have created the most productions, right? So you have, uh, Sony, uh, which owns uh, Columbia TriStar, which used to be a big production house. You have Disney, which owns so many. I mean, Buena Vista uh, Pictures, Touchstone, Lucasfilms, Pixar, Marvel, Fox, um, so many. And then Paramount, uh, which uh, used to be Viacom. Uh, you have Warner Brothers that owns uh, AT&T and Warner Media, uh, And then you have Universal, right, which used to be MCA and uh, now is part of Comcast as well. So that's like the whole NBC, Universal, Comcast brand but those are your major distributors and films um let me see looking sick of time and then the next big distributor that's coming is is netflix so uh netflix or is now so they created 55 original films per year now on average um so it'll take a while to catch up to these other big big giants at 55 a year but 55 films a year that's a lot and their budgets are as high as 200 million dollars so netflix is literally working with with major, major films uh, and major, major budgets. Um, and then revenue streams. So how do movies make money? Um, and again, for time, I'll just, I'll just kind of run through some of this real fast. Um, the, the three main revenue sources for movies is the box office, of course, making, making money you know, at the movie theaters. Then, so imagine a whole year without that, right? That's one really big revenue stream that they lost. But a question I will ask y'all is, is, is the box office the biggest revenue stream? Or what is the biggest revenue stream for the movie industry? So before I mention what the biggest one is, the other one is DVD sales. So not not a really big one. Uh, it's still big enough to have, you know, bring in a few million dollars a year for each production company. But DVD sales is, is another one. But then what's the biggest one? So the biggest one is licensing. So making money off of licensing fees. So, um, you know, it's the biggest revenue stream of the industry and you can license your film to all different types of things these days. I mean, cable TV, uh, home videos, uh, digital distribution through any internet platforms, uh, network TV license fees, right? So if you uh, are go going, like if NBC shows a, a movie or you, you know, I know TNT and USA has movies and all kinds of other channels has uh, movies all the time. Uh, syndication, that's when a movie is pretty much on rotation and it's being played a certain amount of times per per year or even per month or per week. Uh, sometimes there might be a a series that they will do over a weekend, right? So for a whole weekend, we're going to do Game of Thrones or well, not Game of Thrones, uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, Game, of, Game of Thrones is not leaving HBO. Um, but Lord of the Rings might be shown on a TV network, right, for an entire weekend and uh, or all the Rocky movies or something like that. And then also the same thing with, with foreign TV, um, so licensing in, in foreign countries. The last thing I have is what economic forces impact the movie industry what is some economic how, do, how does the economy influence the movie industry and and what times of the year is the movie industry the most profitable So, so, so the big economic forces that, that impact the movie industry is in interest rates and inflation, right? Um, and taxes, of course, too, and things like that, and tax credits and tax breaks. Um, but interest rates and inflation are the biggest uh, influencer on the movie industry and really all industries. And one interesting thing about the movie industry is it's considered, they call it contracyclical, which means it goes against the regular cycle of the economy. So it's, it's usually doing best when the economy is doing great. Uh, but also still does well when we, we go into a recession. Uh, and the movie industry usually doesn't really die down until we're towards the middle and to the middle end of the recession, right? Um, also, there might be certain times of the year where other industries are just following the cycle and doing well, and the movie industry doesn't do too well, right? So during the summer, um, when, when kids are off of school um, and 
people are taking more vacations the movie industry actually does pretty well a lot of if you notice a lot of good movies come out in the summer and then when else do a lot of movies come out in during the holidays right so during thanksgiving and and christmas that's when all your biggest movies are coming out which also creates a lot of competition um during those times but it's a lot of times when families are together they're going to movies um and one of the the lowest points for the movie industry is actually the fall when school starts back up because now families and kids are busy they're going back to school they're starting up their sports they're uh going back to you know to, to work um the vacations are over so those are the times when when the movie industry is not doing as well but when it comes to, to interest rates um you know for since about 2008 because that's the last financial crisis um a lot of y'all were, were really young in 2008 uh, but that's the last time we had a, a financial crisis since then the interest rates set by by the fed right by the federal bank or the federal reserve uh has been set to be really really low and when that interest rate is really low for a long period of time it's not typically a good thing right so right now for about 13 years the interest rates have been pretty low which is great for when you're buying a car when you're buying a house uh, right you get a, you get a really really good interest rate um but that doesn't hold up forever, right? Because then it increases the amount of demand for things and then an increased demand for less supply. So this equal economics thing can increase the price uh, of stuff. And then that's where inflation comes in, in the play, right? So there's three main causes for inflation. Do you, do you all know what causes inflation? Why do prices go up? Why does it get more expensive to make movies? Why is it more expensive to go to school? Why is it more expensive to do, to buy groceries, get gas? What causes inflation? Increase in production costs, okay. What causes that increase, increase in production costs? Or cost of materials, yep. So yeah, the cost. So it's called cost push inflation, right? That is when, um, prices go up because uh you know raw materials get more expensive oil gets more expensive so even when oil gets more expensive right what all transports things right so if you're transporting an entire movie set to a location that's going to be more expensive is the cost of gas is, is more expensive right and that's the same when you're getting groceries delivered to a, a grocery store or anything else right anything that travels on trucks uh semi trucks or even think buses or rvs when you're going traveling on a movie set all that stuff becomes more expensive because the cost of gas is more expensive right um and another thing that that, that is affected by cost push inflation so it's the cost of raw materials or people asking for more money right so if the the minimum wage goes up there, there's still the same cost to the business right so if the business has the same costs then they also have to raise the prices so the uh, cfo for chipotle uh said that with a 15 dollars minimum wage they now have to increase the price of their food. So whenever prices go go up, that gets passed on to the customer, right? So the customer suffers the most like because now they have to pay more, more money for stuff. Um, there's also demand inflation. So that's a second uh, type of inflation out of the third, the three main types of inflation. Uh, and demand inflation is just when there's really, really high demand for something and supply can't keep up, right? So one example of that, not to get too... Uh, uh, philosophical, but like if if there's a gas shortage, right? If there, or if there's a hurricane coming, and everyone goes to buy gas all of a sudden, then normally the cost of gas would go up, right? But then the government will set regulations to uh, prevent price gouging, right? So price gouging will prevent the the gas station from doubling, tripling, quadrupling their their gas. Um, there there is a economic argument that price gouging actually if it's temporarily can be a good thing because then people only buy what they need versus buying up everything uh because then everybody can have gas if there's uh, a crisis coming and everybody goes to buy gas really fast and you have lines wrapped around the the, the, the block to get gas um gas is going to disappear and then there's really high demand and really low supply right and that's going to cause inflation um and then another a third major cause for inflation is the government printing money um you know there's this is like where we get into the whole keynesian economics um this discussion board that y'all that y'all did right so if the government starts printing money um the reason they will do that is to print money to stimulate the economy right so get money out there in the economy get people spending money which creates more jobs and 
uh, Keynesian economics will argue that small amounts of inflation is actually a good thing because, because it does that. It does stimulate the economy. And as long as wages increase at the same rate as prices increase, it's a good thing, right? So if the inflation is 1% and then per year and every year uh, wages increase by 1%, then that's not too bad. But if inflation goes up 3% and wages go up 1%, then, then it's a bad thing, right? So it, it can be a major problem. So it's almost like gambling by using that style of economics because you're, you're pumping money into the economy and if wages don't go up, then, then you could be in trouble. So what happened, um, where was this? This was in Hungary in 1941. They had at one point, they had a uh, 1500 percent inflation, 150,000 percent inflation rate per day. So, something that costs a dollar today on Monday would cost $1,500 on Tuesday and then $22,500 on Wednesday, right? So, if that's happening, what happens to your savings, right? So, your savings is all of a sudden worth nothing anymore because you have a thousand dollars saved up under your under your bed, and hopefully you're not hiding under your bed. But let's say you have a thousand dollars saved up. If something costs a dollar today is now worth fifteen hundred dollars tomorrow, then all of a sudden your savings are gone, right? Um, so that's kind of why I, I talk about like investing. That's why it's so important to have uh, income-producing assets and investments um, to kind of protect yourselves from from inflation. And the, the average inflation rate in the United States is one point eight to two point four percent. And so far this year, we're at 5.4%. So it's over double of what the normal is. And our, and our wages have not increased by 5.4%, right? But that could be a really, really, really political long um, discussion. But basically what I'm, what I'm saying is I'm trying to connect the dots. So income producing assets, right? Creating intellectual property is a way you can create assets for yourself by, so by creating scripts, by creating stories, by creating podcasts, by creating music, or working with people that do those things, right? So not everyone here is necessarily, I, I would say, consider a creative. I think all people are creative. Uh, you just have to find those those creative juices and and exercise them and, and get better at them. But uh, by either being creative and creating things or working with creatives, right? So you guys are in an awesome industry because, you know, studying entertainment, you, you have the ability to work with creatives and, you know, you can work with some really creative, very, very talented people. And whether you're on the creative side or the business side, you can help them grow their businesses. And as their businesses grow, you grow with them, right? So if you're getting only a commission of what they make, uh, a commission of an artist that makes a really good living uh, is, is a good thing. And if you if you start, you know, production companies or labels or anything that, that will now have a share of ownership in this intellectual property is how we can create more value for yourself and for your business. Um, so this, this is why I don't know, one of the many reasons I love the entertainment industry. It's, I mean, it's, it's fun to work with creatives in an industry where you can get to do a lot of cool stuff to, to entertain people. Um, but we got to keep those other factors in mind that affect our industry, right? So interest rates, inflation, uh, tax breaks, all, the, all those different things affect our, our industries that we're going into. So it's important to also be aware of, of those things. So that that's my rant for, for today. I do have an extra credit assignment. Um, making an extra credit because it's not an economics class, even though we're learning about the economics, the entertainment industry, but um, I have a, someone wants extra credit. It could be due at any point, anytime between now and the end of the semester. Um, basically just doing a discussion board, comparing Keynesian economics to Austrian economics. So a lot of you seemed interested in Austrian economics and never even heard the term of either one of them, right? Um, so comparing the two and figuring out what is better for the entertainment industry. And if you want to do this extra credit assignment, you can find any piece of content that's out there. It can be an article, it could be a video, it could be a podcast, whatever, um, where the two are compared uh, or, or debated or whatever. And then kind of just write a discussion board in the same format. Three things you've learned, two, two questions you have based on that, and then one thing, uh, one big takeaway, right? Something that, uh, or, or a thought that, that you have from, from that, a thought that sparked from, from that piece of content. And you, and you can completely choose the piece of content. There's some stuff in, in Canvas under additional materials or whatever it was. Um, what section do I have that under? Um, so on module one, there is a section called module one overview. So in the overview, I added some additional materials and there's a, a debate in there. You could use that or you can find your own uh, content. Um, but feel free to use whatever you want if you want to do the extra credit assignment. And that is all I have for today. So I went a little over an hour. Um, so anybody have any questions or anything y'all want to talk about questions about assignments or anything um this week you have a discussion board due 
Uh, I think the budgeting assignment is due to Sunday. Yep, so the budgeting assignment is due. I uploaded my sheet onto to Canvas. I'm pointing up, I uploaded it to Canvas. Um, so that's, that's there now. Uh, that is under, should be under module two overview, I'm assuming. No, where did I upload that? Or maybe it's under announcements. Does anybody know where I uploaded that? Somebody seen that already? Oh, it's due Friday. Well, let me do that for you, for y'all. Let me push this to Sunday. Let me give y'all some extra time. So I'm gonna push it till, till Sunday. Um, the format for the references, uh, just just give me a Google Doc. Um, I mean, Google Doc, <laughs> everything's a Google Doc in my life. Uh, just a document that, that your references are on. If you're using a spreadsheet, you can use a different tab and put your references on that tab or uh, just on a, like a Word or Google document. That, that's totally, totally fine. Anything else? Any other questions? All right, I've seen some thank yous. Thank you all too. Thank you for, for joining live. I hope you all learned a lot today and uh, have some good takeaways for, for, for real life um, as well. Because I always try to make, have a real life application in here. Um, I know one of, I'm going to talk to one of you after class. So if nobody else has any questions, I'm going to stop the recording here and y'all have an awesome rest of the day. We'll see you Friday at four o'clock and we're going to talk <laughs> music industry, what I've been, the word I've been saying uh, so many times and we're talking movies, but have, have an awesome day and thank y'all for, for being here.